Hello, Life Point friends and family. Thank you for joining us today. If you're new, welcome to the family. May God's message find its way to you no matter where you are. Enjoy the service.
persuade him. God so loved the world. Yes, Lord. Let's praise Jesus this morning. Savior say your strength indeed is small child of weakness watch and pray find in me your all and all cause Jesus paid it all all to him I owe my sin had left a crimson stain he washed it white as snow Look 
what you've done How could you fall so far? You should be ashamed of yourself So I was ashamed of myself The lies I believed They got some roots that run deep I let them take a hold of my life I let them take control of my life Standing in your presence, Lord I can feel you digging all the roots up I feel you healing all my wounds up All I can say is hallelujah In your presence, Lord, I can feel you digging all my roots up. I feel you healing all my wounds up. All I can say is hallelujah. Look what you've done. Look what you've done in me. You spoke your truth into the lies and let my heart believe. Look at me now. Look how you made me new. today and we're so honored to be here we celebrate your resurrection we hope that there's we know that there's everlasting life through you in Jesus name I pray amen good morning welcome to life point church friends and family and if this is your first time here we would love for you to text hello to the number on the screen so that we can connect with you You can also text your prayer request to the same number. And let's just remember, guys, today we are celebrating and reminding ourselves to be grateful of the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. So while we listen to the message today, let's make sure our ears and our hearts are open to receive whatever it is he has for us today. God bless you.
It's a really good idea to know when someone's trying to help you. It seems like a very simple thing to say, but I, I've noticed in life that it's not always an obvious thing. There are many times I'm talking to people or I'm watching them with their lives and while well, they don't get it, there's the people that are around them are trying to help them. They're resisting it. I see this especially in teenagers, but I see it in all ages in recent year, there's been quite a few families that have struggled in terms of their, well, they're teenagers, well, ran away from home because they thought their parents had it in for them. They didn't. They were trying to do everything they could to help them. It's a really good idea to know when someone's trying to help you. The parents that had kids that ran away, you know what they did? They did everything they could to find them. I mean, it was like everything stopped. There was only one thing that was important, and that was finding their missing teenage daughter or son. I can remember having an experience similar to that with a, I don't even know if he was two or three. It's been so, it's been so long, I've forgotten. I don't remember if he was two or three. But my parents and I were down at the Houston Zoo, with my first child who was, I don't know, he was two or three. And my wife would probably tell you exactly how old he was. I don't remember, but he was little. We went to the Houston Zoo and when we left, there was a concert taking place at the Miller Outdoor Theater. So we walked over to it and it was a maze of people that were walking up all at the same time looking for a place to sit. And so we're walking up, the four of us as adults and then the one little guy, and as we're, you know, trying to figure out where we're going to sit, well, all of a sudden we realize, where's David? Everything changed at that moment. We didn't care about the concert. We didn't care about anything. The only thing we cared about was find David. And so we went on this frantic search. We split up and started going through the crowd. I don't know if you've ever been to a large concert at the Miller Outdoor Theater, but there were a lot of people there. We split up and it wasn't immediate that we found him. As it turns out, he wasn't that far away, but it was just hard to see in such, the, the, such a large crowd. He was playing in the grass on a hilly area, having a blast. In the meantime, I think that's the reason I have no hair. <laughs> it was, well, it was terrifying. He was completely unaware that he was in danger. He was completely unaware that the th only thing that mattered to us was finding him. Sometimes when I look at people, I what I find is that they're completely unaware that they're in danger and completely unaware of how much effort God's going to, to try to reach them. It's a good idea to know when someone's trying to help you. Recently, a person I know lost a large sum of money, a large sum of money. I mean, a staggering amount of money related to a hack, an internet hack. Well, this particular person went after it and did, went, did so in such a huge way. I didn't, you know, basically the thought was he'll never get the money back. There's just no way. But because this particular person was a computer person, high level computer person, and they spent a month, make a long story short, they end up getting their money back. Wasn't easy. This is the kind of thing that's in the news today. But what mattered at that point was figuring out how can I get that money back that I invested? So I'm, so I'm asking you the question, what would you do? Your teenage daughter or son takes off. You're missing your two-year-old. Huge sum of cash disappears. Ah, my kid, my two-year-old, I could have said, well, you know, when David gets hungry, he'll come find us. I could have said that. I didn't. 
This other person lost a large sum of cash. He could have said, well, I can just make more. I'm not going to worry about it. Could have. But when you care about something, you do something about it. God cares about you. One of the more famous Bible verses in the whole Bible is John 3, 16. I mean, it's the one that every once in a while you'll see someone hold it up behind a goalpost, John 3, 16. If you don't know what that is, that's a biography of Jesus written by John. The three is a chapter and the 16 is a verse that just helps you find things. And when you read John 3, 16, it says, for God so loved, that's, that's you. He loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. You see, you matter to God. You matter tremendously to God. I don't know if you realize this, but he's trying to help you. He's trying to help you to the degree that he came as the man Jesus. It's as outrageous as this seems, Jesus is God in human form. And when he shows up, here's what he said, Luke 19. This is Jesus' own words. He said this. He said, the son of man, he referred to himself that way many times. He said, I came to seek and to save the lost. Now, who's the lost? The lost are the people that have not yet reconnected with God, that have not come to the realization that they have a problem, that the, the wrong things they've done have broken their relationship with God, that God's both loving and just, and so he can't ignore the wrong that's done, so he has to do something about it. He can't ignore it. And so he came to do something about it. He came on a rescue mission. But he wanted more than that. He also said, I want, I want people to have an abundant life. I want them to have a full life. In John 10, 10, we read, he says, look, I've, I've come that, they, that people may have life and have it to the full. He wants your life here to have meaning and purpose and be, to be lived to the full. That doesn't mean you're not going to have problems. That mean, in fact, he promised that you will have problems. He, well, if you want to claim a Bible promise, you can claim one of his where he said, in this life, you'll have many tribulations. Now, that's not a Bible verse. I know that any, anybody that I know wants to claim and say, yeah, that's what I want. Bring on the problems. What we, want is a, what we want is a nice, cushy life where everything runs smooth. Jesus, what a character. He would use things called parables. And these parables were basically stories that are designed to teach. Some guys came up and gave him a hard time because I don't know how you feel about yourself. You might have a kind of an elevated view of yourself and you think, well, you know, ah, you know, I deserve only the best. Or you might have a view on yourself where like I've screwed up so much in life, I just don't know, you know, I just got to somehow muddle through the rest of it. But Jesus was hanging around with people that nobody else wanted to hang around with. He, he tried to reach the up and out and the down and out. And one time when he was hanging around the people that others thought, well, these people aren't worth the time of day. I mean, why are you wasting time with them? These are the worst of the worst. Why do you even talk to them? Why do you even care about them? He immediately responded with three parables right in a row. It's the only time that we have recorded in the scripture where Jesus went rapid fire, bang, 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 three parables right in a row to drive home the point that people are important. I came for them. I came for every one of you. And it starts off like this. It's a story that if you've been around church, you've heard. It's John, excuse me, in Luke chapter 15, beginning in verse three, we read about a parable called the parable of the lost sheep. And it says this, it says, then Jesus told them this parable to answer the question is why he cares about the people that they don't care about. He says, suppose one of you had a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me. I've found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, as I pause for dramatic effect, there'll be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. If you think you're the biggest screw up in the room, I got some good news for you. God cares about you. He came for you. I want you to have a new beginning. I want you to have forgiveness. I want you to have life to the full. 
After he finished this parable, I'm not going to talk about them, but he went on to talk about the parable of the lost coin of a woman who lost a very valuable coin, and she went on this all-out effort to find it. And when she found it, she threw a party. And the third parable he told is the famous parable of the prodigal son, of a, of a son who just didn't realize his dad was trying to help him. He rebelled against his father, took his inheritance and went off and squandered it and got to the place where he had nothing left. And then he came to his senses and decided to go back to his father. And it's all an illustration of the fact that the God of this universe has got open arms with a welcome for you. He can't wait to have you back to realize that he has the best intentions for you. When you look at what the Bible says, you know, about how to live, things to do, things not to do, it's in your best interest. All those things that he's telling you, do this and don't do this, it's to help you. It's to help you have a life and have life to its fullest. About one-third of the population of the world right now is celebrating Easter because about one-third of the population is Christian. But how do you know it's, how do you know any of this stuff's true? Seriously, how do you, okay, so we're here, we're celebrating Easter, how do, how, how do we know any of this stuff's true? Good question, an important question. I can get to give you rapid fire some reasons. One is, Math. Huh? Yeah, math. You're saying, I'm bored. That's okay. Hang on. <laughs> what is the statistical probability of one person fulfilling 200 different prophecies? Those of you with advanced level math degrees realize that you can't calculate that. The number's too big. How did the when the three wise men showed up in Jerusalem and they asked, where's the king who's, who's been born? Where's the Messiah? The people said, well, we don't know what you're talking about, but we do know this. We know that the scriptures predict that the Messiah will be born in Bethlehem. So they knew where to go find the Messiah based on the predictions that were in the Bible. There were hundreds of them and Jesus fulfilled them all. Those of you that aren't good in math, just know this. The statistical probability of somebody fulfilling all those things, and by the way, he couldn't control where he was born, could he? Is so huge. That in itself is evidence enough. But it doesn't stop there. When you look at his life, when you look at his, the way he loved people, when you look at the way he taught, nobody lived like, loved like, <laughs> taught like Jesus. If, I mean, what a guy. I mean, even people that don't like anything about this, like Jesus. Amazing guy. And then the miracles. You say, well, I don't know. I don't see how you could do a miracle. I'm not into miracles. I don't see how you could do it. Okay, I get it, but that's really the wrong question. But here, keep this in mind. Even his enemies admitted he did miracles. They were they didn't know how he did it. They were mad that he did it. They were concerned about the fact that he did those miracles, but even they acknowledged that he was doing them. For me, miracles are a big deal. The only question is, is there a God? Is there a God behind all of this? If there's a God behind it, what we're calling a miracle is a piece of cake. So that's not really the question. The real question is, is there a God? If there's a God, then miracles aren't a problem. That's the real question. The other thing is, is when you stop and think about it, he predicted his own death, burial, and resurrection and pulled it off. Personally, I pay a lot of attention to anybody that can predict their own death, burial, and resurrection and pull it off. He did. He was telling all his disciples that what was going to happen before it happened. They were scratching their heads going, wait a minute, you know, this is a parable. Okay, right. Okay. This is like the lost sheep. Okay. How does this one work? You know, they, they didn't see it as a literal thing. They saw it as one of those, another one of those parables. And so when they, when they actually saw it happening, they freaked out. They thought, He's dead. They saw him. They said, wait a minute. Everything they thought was going to happen, none of it was going to happen because he's dead. They saw him die. They saw the spear shoved into his side. They saw the water and blood flow out, which doctors will tell you is an indication that it pierced the 
outer layer of the heart and the heart. And anyway, he's dead. They saw him dead. And dead men don't come back to life. They can't bring themselves back to life, right? Of course. Except he did. Because he was God and man at the same time. And then the next thing I'm going to tell you won't seem like any sense of proof to you at all because of the culture that we live in. But God on purpose made women the first witnesses to his resurrection. You say, what? wait a minute, that, huh? How is that anything? It's a big deal because at that particular point, women couldn't even testify in court. Don't throw anything at me. That wasn't my rule. That was what they, that's what they did. And so their testimony wouldn't even be allowed in a court, but yet on purpose, he made women the first witnesses to what happened to him. Elevated the position of women. So if you're making up a story, you don't make it up in that day and age with women as your first witnesses. You say, that's not much of a proof. You're right. Let's keep going. The disciples had scattered. They were scared to death. They were in hiding. After they saw the resurrected Jesus, it changed. I mean, wouldn't it change you? And then every one of them except one died a martyr's death. You would think, okay, if anybody knew it wasn't true, it would be one of the disciples. You'd think if it was a lie that at least one of the disciples at some point would say, wait a minute, don't kill me. It was all a lie. I, I, I made it all up. But yet every last one of them was willing to die a martyr's death because they knew it was true. How do you get all those men all to die, all separate deaths in different locations for a lie? You say, well, people die all the time for a lie. Yes, they do. But they don't die for something that they know is a lie. And, these, and you think if it was a lie and all, all 11 of them knew it, you think at least one of them would try to save his life at some point. But they didn't because they knew it was the truth. They saw the resurrected Jesus. Then you look at the main enemy of all Jesus' followers was a guy named Paul. The main enemy, I mean, talking number one, the guy who was out to kill Christians and did kill Christians, put them in prison, persecuted them. He became a Christian when? After he met the resurrected Jesus. Then you look in the Bible and you find a book that's called James and you find one called Jude. So those are the brothers of Jesus. The Bible indicates that, that these brothers, when Jesus first began his public ministry, said, I don't know what's with Jesus. There's something wrong with him. Why is he saying all these things? They didn't believe he's, that he was the Messiah. But when you read, go read James and Jude, the very first parts of it, and you'll see that they refer to Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Why? Because they saw the resurrected Jesus. What would it take to convince you that your brother was the Messiah, that your brother was God in human form? Well, it'd take a lot, right? It took a lot for them. And then we start looking down through the ages. I, uh, I'm still a mess, but I'm less of a mess than I used to be. If you were to talk to my wife, she'd say I'm a much better husband than I used to be. In fact, dramatically better. And the reason I'm dramatically better is because each year I've been growing as a Christian and I've been experiencing the pods of life change that Jesus has brought about in me. I care about people I didn't used to even pay any attention to. I'm just one of billions that can say the same thing. The, the, the life change that I've experienced, the positive life change that I've experienced. Now, I wish I had it all together. I wish I never messed up, but I do. But, I've, but like, my, like I've said many times, my goal next year is to be less of a knucklehead then than I am now. And so I make some progress. So what does it mean to be a Christian anyway? How do you become one? What was Jesus all about in all this? One of the more uh, famous things that you can look at is what, we, what some people refer to as the Roman road. 
In Romans chapter 3, verse 23, it, it says, you know, all of us have sinned. We've all done things that are wrong. We've, we've been selfish and lustful and greedy and, well, I mean, do I need to start listing all the different? I don't, I don't think, I think, yeah, I can stop there. We've all done things that are just, well, they're just wrong. And we have a bigger problem with that than, than we realize if I only did one thing a day wrong, just one, in a year's time, it's 365. And if I live 70 years, real quick, do the math. What's 70 times 365? Well, it's over 25,000. Well past it. If you were hauled before a Fort Bend County judge with more than 25,000 violations of law, you'd be in some kind of a mess, wouldn't you? We have a bigger problem with doing wrong than what we realize. And the, and the Bible says in Romans 6, 23, that, that the wages of sin is death. It means it's referring to spiritual death. In other words, our relationship with God is broken because of it. But what God wants to do is he gives us this gift, this gift of eternal life, which is found through Jesus. So how does that work? Well, let's find out. It says in Romans 5, 8, that, that God knew exactly what I'm like, God knows exactly what you're like. And it says that, what does it say? That he demonstrates his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He knew exactly what we're like, exactly the struggles that I have. Everything that you, all those secret thoughts, all those horrible things that nobody knows that you've done or thought and all that. He knows all that. And yet he came to die for you, to provide forgiveness for you, to, have, to provide full life for you. Then in Romans 10, 13, it says this, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone who comes to church on Easter will be saved. No. <laughs> everyone who reads the Bible every once in a while will be saved. No. Everybody who gives some money every once in a while will be saved. No. Everybody that attends a life group will be saved. Everybody that, well, you see the point. I had a little problem when I was 19. I grew up going to church. I knew about God, but I didn't know God. If you'd given me a multiple choice test, I could have answered a lot of questions right. Wouldn't have liked it, could have done it. It wasn't until I was 19 that I realized that I had never actually myself trusted Jesus to forgive me of my sin. It hadn't become my faith. My parents had faith. They were great followers of Jesus. But there had never been a point in my life where I, where I did business, so to speak, with Jesus, where I said, Jesus, I've sinned too. I'm sorry about my sin. And Jesus, I'm asking you to forgive me and be the leader of my life. Or use biblical language. I'm asking you to save me from the penalty of my sin, to be my savior. I'm asking you to be my Lord. I'm asking you to lead me because you can do a better job of leading my life than I can. It wasn't until I was 19 and I was talking to a friend of mine and when he was talking about how he became a Christian and it stunned the daylights out of me that he became a Christian. And in that, pro in that whole process, it was 4.30 in the morning. I yeah, remember, 19, that's when, who goes to bed before 4.30? So it's 4.30 in the morning. He's telling me all that. We're winding down. And all of a sudden, it, it just, that's when I realized I'd never trusted Jesus for forgiveness myself. I'd never called upon the name of the Lord myself. It, my parents' faith. It wasn't my faith. In Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, it says this. It says, for it's by grace you've been saved. Grace, that means you, you can't earn it. It's, it's something that's given to you that you don't deserve. For it's by grace you've been saved through faith. In other words, you, you trust God to forgive you. You trust him to do what he said he will do. That's what faith is. Use the word trust. And it's not from yourself. It's a gift of God. It's a gift. You don't earn it. You're not by being good, not by getting your act together. It's not by works so that no one can boast. Hmm. I'm going to take you on a little, kind of a strange ride for a minute. Hang on. Everybody does what they do for a reason. You do what you do for a reason. You may have heard all this before. Oh, Okay and walked away without it really impacting your life. And you did it for a reason. I'd like for you to get in touch with your reason, whatever it is, and to own it. 
There are lots of reasons, and I don't blame you for having the reasons. I'd like for you to identify them because I'd like, I think once you identify them, it might help you. I put together a little list. The first thing in the list says that self is a problem sometimes. You know what? Sometimes, I don't know women this way, but I know men are. I'm being nice to women. It's always a good idea. <clears throat> but us men, sometimes we don't want anybody telling us anything. You can suggest a few things. Don't, even, don't start barking orders. I don't want anybody to be the leader in my life. I just, hey, just me. So sometimes the reason we resist the whole thing about following Jesus is, I just, hey, not for me. Sometimes people think, yeah, you can't be smart and believe this. Yes, you can. There are brilliant people. I'm talking brilliant geniuses that are Christians. And there are people that are, uh, well, let's say, how can we say it? There are people that aren't so smart that are Christians. And there are people that are, have rejected Christianity that are incredibly brilliant. And there are people that are, well, not so smart that have rejected Christianity. You have to throw out the smart or not so smart thing as a reason that people are Christians or not. You just, that's not a factor. You can't put that in your equation. I can introduce you to people that would have Nobel Peace Prizes that are considered geniuses that are Christians. You say, well, science. I, I just, it's because of science. Well, I have a degree in chemistry. I taught in Tarrant College for five years. Most of the professors that I worked with were Christians. Not all of them, most of them in that particular university. Now you can go to some other universities, the whole, st the whole staff is not a Christian. It just, it just depends on where you're at. But here's the point. You can't say that the science is a reason you can't become a Christian. Factor that out. If you think that's part of it, then you're ignoring the fact that Jesus was resurrected. Sometimes, okay, we're getting personal now. Sometimes, hey, I just do some things that are wrong and I like doing them. And I think if I became a Christian, I was supposed to stop doing those things, which I like to do. And so I'm not going to tell you this is a reason but that I'm not going to become a Christian. But here, I mean, I'm, if it's just me and you and we're on, off by ourselves, nothing's being recorded. I mean, okay I'll, okay, I'll own up to it. I'm not becoming a Christian because I like this stuff I'm doing. And I, it's, whether it's right or wrong, I don't get it, really care. I like doing it. I'm going to keep doing it. Own it. If that's the reason, make it. You say, no, actually, it's Christians I've, I've known. Some of these Christians, man, they're just sorry. I mean, they've treated me so badly. Some, I knew a Christian once, he cheated me out of money or whatever. I mean, just make up your story. I had parents that were Christians, and they were horrible people. Maybe they were. I know Christians have had done some horrible things, like the Crusades. Yeah. It was a horrible thing. Can I introduce you to what atheists have done in the name of atheism? Can I begin to tell you about historically what agnostics have done? If you're a student of history, very quickly, you, you, you just connected with that one, and you understand that people bo both that name the name of Christ, name the name of agnostic, name the name of atheism, every, one, every last one of them has done wrong, sometimes great wrong. In fact, it kind of reminds me of the Bible verse we started with, for all have sinned. So you can't, if you're going to reject Christianity because you know some Christians have done some bad things, I can tell you doctors that have done bad things. Is he, okay, lawyers, we know that for sure. But anyway, uh, uh, teachers that have done bad things, bankers that have done bad things. I mean, so you're going to reject all of those because there were some that did bad things that were one of those? I, it's, that's not a reason to reject all this. Well, then what about society? Well, hey, here's the truth. I, I don't know why I do what I do, but hey, if my friends say it's cool, I'm going to do it because I'm just going to go with the flow. Whatever they say, that's what goes. I mean, if a culture says go left, I'm going left. Culture says go right, I'm going right. Whatever, I'm just going to go with it. If that's your version to determine right and wrong, I think you're making a mistake. But you say, that's the reason I'm going with it. Right now, I think society's moving away from it, so I think I'm just going to move away from it. 
And that's my reason. Satan. Now there, you say, now I'm starting to get uncomfortable now. Satan. Well, all that is is an angel that rebelled against God because they have the ability to choose too. They have a free will. They can choose to do right. They can choose wrong. He was a head angel. He chose to do wrong. It has a name. Not like Hollywood. Whatever, you th whatever Hollywood's taught you, throw it out. It's not the way it is. But the Bible does indicate this, that Satan is at work trying to deceive you. Yes, deceive you to keep you from believing any of this to be true. You say, what about all the suffering in the world? I mean, I'm not going to become a Christian because of all the suffering in the world. Well, wait, remember that uh, all these things are taking place. There is a great deal of suffering in the world, but that's not a reason to reject it. The one who, I, when you, if you were to look at what Jesus went through in the terms of the suffering that he went through, it's huge that he went through in order to take the punishment for our sin. But here's one reason I think sometimes people haven't done it. They've really never gotten around to actually looking at what Scripture says for themselves. You can read a biography of Jesus out loud. Google it. Do it right now. If you're bored, get your phone out. Google how long does it take to read the biography of Jesus out loud. You pick one, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. You'll see it's three hours, roughly about three hours. It doesn't take a long time. If you've never read one of the biographies of Jesus, it makes no sense to me. You should. And so all of these things could be holding you back. I'm getting older now. I'm not 18 anymore. And I have an incredible burden. I know that when I die, I'm going to heaven. Not because I've been good, but because I've asked Jesus to forgive you my sin, be my Savior. And when I look to my left, when I look to my right, I want to see you. I want to see you. I want to see you. I would hate to think that you got this close and you didn't cross the line of faith. How do you do it? It's just, well, sometimes we show prayers like this. Jesus, thank you for loving me. I'm sorry for my sins. I need what I don't deserve to be forgiven. Thank you for dying on the cross for me and proving it all to be true in the resurrection. I'm trusting you to forgive me and lead my life. I want to follow you. Saying those words doesn't make you a Christian. I'm going to demonstrate it right now. Hey, God. Okay, Jesus. Okay, Jesus. Okay. Thank you for loving me. Uh, I'm sorry for all my sins. I say, what else? Oh, okay, well, I'm supposed to say, I need what I don't deserve to be forgiven. You can see that doesn't work, does it? You see, it's not the words that make you a Christian. It's when you trust, it's a personal thing. It's when you trust Jesus to forgive you. It's a relational thing. It's when you say, Jesus, I, I don't get it all, but all of a sudden, and I can't explain it. All of a sudden, I know it's true. I don't get it. Well, let me give you a little hint. God has a spirit that's at work that's tugging on the hearts of those of you who are far from him right now. And if you feel this little tug, that's God's spirit working on you to bring you back into a relationship with him because he loves you. And so what you're doing at this particular point is you're saying, Jesus, I don't get it, but here's what I do get. I've sinned and I'm sorry. There's a fancy Bible word for that. It's called repentance. But Jesus, I'm, I've sinned and I'm sorry and I'm asking you to forgive me. I want you to lead my life because I believe you can do a better job of leading my life than I can. I want to follow you. I don't really get it all, but I want, I want to help me know how, what that means and how to do it. You see, when you, when, you, when you mean it, when you trust Jesus to forgive you, that's how you become a Christian. We celebrate Easter because Jesus was resurrected. Someone asked me why I'm a Christian. It's a real simple answer because of the resurrection. If there's no resurrection, there's no Christianity. None of this is true. And because there was one, I am one. It's the reason to be a Christian. Some of you aren't ready, but some of you are. Some of you need to have, honestly have a discussion. We have stuff we give away. We'll have discussions. We will help you. It's for, actually, most people end up talking to us, want to talk to us more, not less. 
But some of you are actually ready. You know you're ready. You don't have all the answers. You'll never have all the answers. But you know enough. You know enough. And so if you're ready to cross the line of faith with me, here's what I suggest you do. I suggest you pray this prayer with me and mean it. Jesus, thank you for loving me. I'm sorry for my sins. I need what I don't deserve to be forgiven. Thank you for dying on the cross for me and proving it to all to be true in the resurrection. I'm trusting you to forgive me and to lead my life, to be my Savior and Lord. And I want to follow you from now on. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I wish you could have known me when I used to ride a motorcycle like a bat out of hell. I was the guy that everybody hated. I could tell you stories and how God changed me. And God can change you too. I have passed a point of weary Is it bird away in hell? Is it all too much to carry? Let me tell you about my Jesus Do you feel that empty feeling? Cause seems done all that's stealing Now you're desperate for some healing Let me tell you about my Jesus he makes a way where there ain't no way Rises up from an empty grave Ain't no sinner that he can't save Let me tell you about my Jesus His love is strong and his grace is free And the good news is I know that he Can do for you what he's done for me Let me tell you about my Jesus And let my Jesus change your life Broken dreams and wasted years Until the past to disappear Oh, let me tell you about my Jesus And all the wrong turns that you heard Going under if you could Who can work it out for your good Let me tell you about my Jesus He makes a way where there ain't no way Rises up from an empty grave Sinner that he can't save Let me tell you about my Jesus His love is strong and his grace is sweet And the good news is I know that he can do for you What he's all for me Let me tell you about my Jesus Let my Jesus change your life The price for all my guilty Who would care that much about me Let me tell you about my Jesus Oh He makes a way where there ain't no way Rises up from an empty grave Ain't no sinner that he can't save Let me tell you about my Jesus His love is strong and his grace is free and the good news is I know that he can do for you what he's done for me. Let me tell you about my Jesus. And let my Jesus change your life. Yeah.